Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before it's a privilege for me on behalf of the Victoria Study Group to present our trial, but before beginning, let me commend the college for their create creativity and their commitment to share this uh, meeting uh, virtually at this uh, extraordinary time. And uh, my disclosures uh, are depicted here. Uh, and uh, uh, as well, I want to point out that the Victoria trial was supported by grants from Merck and Fire. By way of background, optimal guideline-based therapy with patients with chronic heart failure uh, is uh, substantially associated with both death and heart failure hospitalization, especially after a recent worsening heart failure event. Hence, new therapies to address this unmet need and alleviate this major healthcare burden are desirable. One such option, based on our phase two findings, is the novel guanolate cyclase stimulator, Verisigwat which directly enhances the cyclic GMP pathway. Hence in Victoria, we assess the efficacy and the safety of verisigwat in patients with reduced ejection fraction and chronic heart failure with a recent worsening heart failure event. By way of background in this cartoon, uh, I highlight that diminished nitric oxide and decreased uh, SGC are hallmarks of heart failure and they're precipitated by both endothelial dysfunction and oxidative stress. Importantly, verisigwat directly stimulates the soluble guanolate cyclase uh, and produces GMP. Uh, it also restores nitric oxide sensitivity. And GMP, of course, is fundamentally important as it relates to the regulation of uh, the vasculature and the heart. Our objectives in Victoria were to assess whether verisigwat reduces the primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or first hospitalization. Our secondary outcomes were components of the primary, total heart failure hospitalizations, both first and recurrent, the composite of all cause mortality or first heart failure hospitalization, mortality overall, and of course the safety and tolerability of verisigwat in this high risk population with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. The inclusion criteria are depicted here. Patients had chronic heart failure, New York heart class two to four, ejection fraction less than 45, on guideline-based therapy. They'd had a recent worsening event with either recent heart failure hospitalization or alternatively IV diuretic use. They had very elevated natriuretic peptides with the criteria in sinus rhythm and in atrial fibrillation depicted here. And uh, to be randomized, they could have been either inpatient or outpatient, but they must have met critical uh, criteria for stability, have a systolic blood pressure uh, at or above 100, uh, with IV therapies discontinued for more than 24 hours. We had a 30-day screening period, uh, but no run-in uh, was involved. The exclusion criteria included the use of long-acting nitrates or phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, those awaiting heart transplantation or other severe uh, circumstances, uh, a GFR below 15 or renal dialysis, and other conventional comorbidities, uh, both uh, of the cardiac and non-cardiac uh, conditions. Our design is depicted here, and patients were randomized to verisigwat or placebo, and then a stepwise increase in dose to our target of 10 milligrams undertaken over the subsequent two weeks. Patients were then uh, followed every 16 weeks uh, and uh, until our primary endpoints were achieved, and then a safety follow-up uh, was uh, commenced for 14 days. The assumptions going into the trial were as follows. The sample size was derived by uh, the cardiovascular death uh, uh, endpoint, a hazard ratio of 0 0.80 with an 11% cardiovascular death anticipated in the placebo group at 12 months. To have 80% 80, 80 power for this, we needed 782 cardiovascular deaths and a sample size of 4872 was estimated uh, to have uh, the consort diagram depicted in this slide indicates that we assessed 6,857 patients, randomized 5,050, equally allocated to both verisigwat and placebo, and uh, we had complete uh, follow-up uh, for our endpoint in 99.6 patients randomized to verisigwat and 99.5% for those in placebo. 
This slide gives you a snapshot of some of the baseline characteristics. Uh, they were, uh, oh, they were uh, 67 years of age, 24% females, about two thirds had a hospitalization within three months uh, of the uh, heart failure uh, uh, worsening event. Uh, the remainder uh, either three to six months or IV diuretic use. Ejection fraction, 29%. Uh, 40% were either in class three mainly or class four. Median natriuretic peptide was substantially elevated, as you can see, at over 2,800 picograms per mil. About 60% of patients had triple guideline paced therapy, either beta blockers, MRA antagonists, or uh, angiotensin uh, inhibition. And indeed, over 90% had, had, had dual uh, uh, guideline based therapy. And importantly, over 32% uh, had uh, either an ICD, a biventricular pacer, or both. So these patients were well treated. The primary composite event rate is depicted on this slide, cumulative event rate on the vertical axis and months since randomization on the horizontal axis. The placebo curve is depicted here. The Vera-Sigwatt curve depicted here. The hazard ratio 0 0.90, the p-value for the primary endpoint 0 0.019. This translates into an absolute event reduction of 4.2 per 100 patients year. Importantly, as one looks at these curves, the curves separate at around three months, and you can see that the uh, placebo event rate is strikingly high, uh, leading to a median follow-up of about 10.8 months before the primary objectives were achieved. The forest plot uh, with the overall hazard ratio depicted here and the 13 pre-specified subgroups uh, is uh, identified in this slide. And because it's rather crowded, I'm going to highlight some of the ones of particular interest that I think uh, you'll be interested in. As you can see, age greater than 75 appears to uh, have some heterogeneity. Uh, geographic uh, uh, distribution seems to line up pretty well, as does the index event. The New York Heart class, about 14% of patients were on baseline Secubitol well certain, and the treatment effect appears to be uh, fairly similar. Uh, GFR, most of patients were above 30, 30 to 60, and greater than 60. And you can see the uh, hazard ratio here. The natriuretic peptide for quartiles pre-specified shows an interesting heterogeneity with a significance of 0 0.001 uh, of some interest. Note that the upper quartile began at a picogram uh, ml natriuretic peptide of in excess of 5,300. The primary uh, endpoint components are depicted here, cardiovascular death on the left, and uh, you can see uh, not significant, although uh, congruent and directionally similar to the overall endpoint, and the hazard ratio for the heart failure hospitalization and the p-value of 0 0.048 on the right panel. All-cause death and first heart failure hospitalization, which was our secondary composite endpoint, is depicted here. And again, you see placebo. There is SIGWAT, the hazard ratio 0 0.90 with a p-value of 0 0.021. Let me take you in some detail into this table uh, and highlight first on the upper panel uh, the data that was derived from that first Kaplan-Meier curve I showed you with the hazard ratio, the p-value, uh, the incidence rates here, but the events per 100 patients years bolded for a simple, simple uh, ass assessment. And here you see the 4.2 absolute event rate uh, associated with this extraordinary placebo event rate of 37.8. If one looks then at the other secondary endpoints, death 13.9, 12.9, heart failure hospitalization 29.1, 25.9, and total heart failure hospitalizations, which did not appear on the Kaplan-Meier curves depicted here, 42.4 and 38.3, the secondary composite endpoint uh, as depicted here and all-cause mortality shown here. Adverse events that we pre-specified of interest were both symptomatic hypotension and syncope. And as you can see in this slide, both trended to be higher, not surprisingly, in the better cigarette group, 9.1 versus 7.9, syncope 4.0 versus 3.5. To summarize safety and tolerability, 
symptomatic hypotension and syncope tended to be more common with varicigwat. There was more anemia with varicigwat, 7.6 versus 5.7 with placebo. Importantly, serious adverse events were nearly identical, 32.8 with, with varicigwat, 34.8 with placebo. Also, no adverse effects of varicigwat on either electrolytes or renal function were observed. And at 12 months, we achieved the 10 milligram target dose in nearly 90% of varicigwat, fairly similar to those in the placebo group. So in summary, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, varicigwat was significantly more effective than placebo in reducing our primary endpoint, the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, and also uh, all heart failure hospitalizations, both first and recurrent. There was directional alignment uh, in the reduction in cardiovascular death that did not achieve statistical significance, no change in all-cause mortality. Heterogeneity was noted in the natriuretic peptide quartile subgroup and indeed is the subject of ongoing investigation. Titrated to 10 milligrams, varicigwat was generally safe and well tolerated, and there was ec excellent application of guideline-based therapy in this population, and as you've seen, excellent patient follow-up. So in conclusion, Victoria enrolled a very high-risk heart failure population with significant unmet needs not well addressed by prior studies. It engages a new therapeutic target by enhancing the cyclic GMP pattern. It achieved a clinically meaningful absolute primary event reduction of 4.2 per 100 patient years in the presence of guideline-based care. That translates into a number needed to treat for one year to prevent one primary outcome of 24 patients in a high-risk uh, heart failure-reduced ejection fraction population, followed for 10.8 months. Because varicigwat is a once-daily medicine, easy to titrate, generally safe and well-tolerated, Without the need for monitoring renal function or electrolytes, it may play a useful role in patients with recent worsening heart failure. I want to thank the uh, many colleagues uh, that helped to produce uh, this trial and the national leads across 42 countries, the oversight provided by our data and safety monitoring board, and the adjudication by our events co uh, committee located at DCRI. I particularly want to thank the 616 investigative sites across all regions of the world and the patients who volunteered and allowed us to undertake this uh, investigation. For those interested in pursuing it uh, in more detail, uh, I can indicate that uh, today the online publication in the New England Journal of Medicine will provide you the necessary details and a context piece published also simultaneously in circulation will allow for some comparison across novel therapies of what Victoria trial brings uh, to the heart failure population. All of these and other resources will be available on the CDC website uh, depicted here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Dr. Armstrong, for uh, presenting this very important trial. And I'll, I'll ask Dr. Clyde Gancy to uh, make some comments. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. I'd like to give my thanks and gratitude to the college for coming up with a very important opportunity to deliver information under the unprecedented times in which we're working. I'd also like to acknowledge our comrades in cardiology who obviously are frontline responders and wish them well and wish their safety to be a factor that we can hopefully um, embrace. I want to congratulate Dr. Armstrong particularly for bringing forward the Victoria trial results. I think we need to sit back and acknowledge that we have another win in the treatment of heart failure, and that's a good thing. As Dr. Armstrong referred, we have a really wonderful background now of guideline-directed medical therapy for reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Previously, it was fairly straightforward with inhibitors of the RAS system, evidence-based beta blockers, mineral or corticoid antagonists, and implantable devices, but now we know that that portfolio has been expanded to include the RNA compound, evabridine, the SGLT2 inhibitors, both for prevention and now for treatment, perhaps. And to this, now we can add Virisiguat. This really is an important statement because it allows us to focus on nitric oxide. As you've already heard, nitric oxide exerts a favorable effect on vascular homeostasis through upregulation of cyclic GMP by the interface of nitric oxide and soluble guanolate cyclase. That's important because there are a number of cardiovascular disease states, especially heart failure, 
where nitric oxide bioavailability is reduced. We've tried to target this before with exogenously administered nitrates, with phosphate aerospace inhibitors, but we've not been very effective. The current Victoria trial was preceded by the antecedent phase two Socrates reduced trial, that soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction study and high risk worsening heart failure. Importantly, in that study, it demonstrated that Virasaguat, because it is a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, did show a favorable response on an important surrogate of heart failure, specifically NT pro BMP. Now we see the results of Victoria, and we're enthused with these results. As you've seen, this is a phase three international trial, 5,000 patients event driven, that was executed in a population with chronic heart failure characterized by recent worsening, either because of a hospitalization within three or six months or the requirement for outpatient parenteral diuretic therapy. This occurred in a background of evidence-based guideline-directed therapy, triple therapy, 60%, dual therapy and 90%. So as Dr. Armstrong said, quite well treated, a very simple dose titration to achieve a goal dose of 10 milligrams versus placebo. The composite endpoint is important. The hazard ratio is 0.9, the p-value is significant, the confidence intervals are reasonably tight. There was an issue with hypotension and anemia. Those are questions worth exploring, particularly the anemia. And it's evident that the composite endpoint was driven by a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, primarily as cardiovascular mortality was not different. There are several aspects of the trial that merit emphasis. Here's the first. Hospitalization for heart failure generates a major inflection point in the natural history of this condition with a marked change in the risk for rehospitalization and death. Up until now, no prior therapies have attenuated this risk except for more intensive process of care improvement strategies. Now we have a therapy that may be the first one to change that natural history after a person with heart failure has had a worsening event. The second important aspect is that the therapeutic intervention, Virasuquat, has a simple administration. It requires minimal titration. And as we've seen, the side effect profile is tolerable. The third important aspect of this trial is that after a number of years of working through these discovery issues, it looks as if modulating nitric oxide bioavailability is executable and it represents a target for future interventions. But as with all good research, more questions do arise. This risk of death after heart failure hospitalizations appears recalcitrant to any of the current medical therapies. That is still an issue that we have to address. What about HEFPEF? There was indeed a Socrates preserved trial, but it failed to show the same kind of favorable signal on NT pro BNP or left atrial volume, but quality of life and functional status may have been improved. The Vitality HEFPEF trial is a phase 2b trial, which is ongoing. Primary endpoint is a change in the KCCQ score. Perhaps that will demonstrate whether or not there's utility for Virasaquad in this important patient population. Here's another question that comes about. The percent of black patients in the Victoria trial was low at less than 5%. That's important because there are prevailing concerns that this unique patient population may exhibit exquisite NO bioavailability concerns. Thus, an opportunity emerges to further study Virasaquat in black patients with heart failure. There's several other things that Merritt mentioned. First, cost and cost effectiveness are unknown. Polypharmacy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is now officially a problem. I think that's a good one to have because we didn't have that concern for many years and now we have to recognize their multiple choices. But with that recognition, we have to understand that the time is now to be even more focused on precision medicine and understanding which patient under what circumstances should the current availability of treatments for heart failure be administered. Overall, then, I do believe that the results of Victoria constitute another win for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and an important opportunity to further modulate the natural history of this condition. Understanding which patients benefit most, I think, is a key next step. I would encourage investigators to remain diligent in their efforts to sort out what is the ideal patient population. Again, I extend my congratulations and extend my best wishes to members of the college at this unprecedented time.
Thank you, Dr. Walsh. Thank you, Dr. Lister. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you, Dr. Yancey. And Dr. Stevenson, I'd like to hear your comments on the trial as well. Yes, well, as Dr. Yancey has emphasized, this is not only a therapy for a new physiologic target, but it's also for a new population. The patients with recent heart failure hospitalization for decompensation have been actively excluded from all the trials that have shown benefit. And recent trials that do focus on this population have consistently shown no benefit. So Victoria finally addresses this population of decompensated patients. These are not the hospitalized patients of the last century. Those patients were evolving from the Digen diuretics era uh, through gradual penetration of RAS inhibition, beta blockade, and more recently the CRT, these decreased heart failure progression and sudden death, and sudden death was further reduced by implantable defibrillators. So the patients we see now in the hospital have evolved to a later stage during this prolongation of survival on the beneficial therapies. Those of us who spend time on inpatient services have been trying to portray this contemporary population. It's a unique population with longer disease duration, more severe disease, and narrow options. The Heart Fear Apprentice Network, for instance, uh, from the NHLBI, identified this population as giving rise to most of the unanswered questions and unmet needs. So this trial focused on patients with recent hospitalizations, most within the past three months, a very high risk group. This group together with those patients needing intravenous diuretics have recurrent congestion despite a high penetrance of our currently recommended therapies. Comparison with a stable paradigm population showed more than double the initial levels of BNP and NT pro BNP. And in this population, the majority of patients during the trial for paradigm had no clinical evidence of congestion. And of note, their occurrence of congestion uh, was diminished by having sucubitol valsartan on board. So the dramatic difference between Victoria and previous trials is undermined by the event rate. It was not only high, but it was higher than predicted, which is usually um, the opposite of what happens in trials. The CV death rate was 14% per 100 patient years compared to 11% predicted. And the overall event rate was 18%, was 38%, excuse me, in a year. So note the number needed to treat in the paradigm population to decrease the composite outcome was 38 for a year compared to 24 for the Victoria trial because this is such a sick population. There are a couple of interesting historical points about recommended therapies in sick populations. In the original consensus trial in 1987 of enalapril in hospitalized patients, the benefit of ACE inhibitors was not demonstrated in that third of patients who were already on nitrates, interestingly enough, only in the patients who were not. In the VHEF2 trial, which compared ACE inhibitors to hydralazine isodil, in the subgroup of patients with class three and four heart failure, the outcomes were exactly the same for ACE inhibitors and hydralazine nitrates, which is often forgotten. Most clinicians who treat advanced heart failure continue to use nitrates in some settings because we're convinced that they at least seem to improve symptoms for some patients. Regarding the cyclic GMP pathway, it remains to be determined whether some of the benefit of sucubitril valsartan does result from prolonged stability of the nitriuretic peptides which activate the cyclic GMP pathway. But certainly Verisigwat addresses this uh, in a more focused way. Dr. Yancey has reviewed the remarkable progressive advances in outcome uh, on our traditional triad of therapies. We now see a bimodal population with heart failure. Those who are doing very well on recommended therapies, uh, with recent demonstration in Denmark that of 20,000 patients who were 70 or younger did not have comorbidities, um, their five-year survival was 86%. And of those, most did not even have an increase in diuretics. Dr. Yancey and I agree that there may be a better term than heart failure for this healthy end of the spectrum. On the other hand, those patients with recurrent congestion and hospitalization despite the traditional triad, those are the patients uh, who need personalization of their care from all these options uh, because they're not necessarily going to respond as a group. Um, and Verisigwat offers this really new therapy for this. Uh, in addition to the breakthrough of the therapy, I want to congratulate the Victoria Group on their international collaboration. This high level is so desperately needed moving forward, both for the science and for the appreciation and respect for different cultures represented. This is the mode of international collaboration that's so desperately needed in what's become the world war against a virus. Verisigwad is the first therapy, especially for the benefit 
of patients whose disease has advanced to require hospitalization. This is a vital step forward in recognizing and addressing this heart failure population in which so much morbidity and mortality is concentrated. Echoing Winston Churchill on the brink of a previous world war, perhaps for this advanced population and hopefully for the war on COVID, perhaps we've arrived at the end of the beginning. Thank you.